Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker. And today, let's talk about living. As I grew older, I had to become mindful of the delusion of thinking others are as aware of me and my situation as I assumed. Funny enough, those same people also assumed this about me as well, that I actually spent my time thinking about them. This led to misunderstandings and frustrations and hurt feelings. It is truly an unfair thing to assume people desire to be devoted in the way you assume they ought to be. I felt I was being asked to prioritize other people and put aside the things that I thought were more important. Isn't your own life worth diving fully into? Should we keep back portions of ourselves and our time to devote to other people? If this sounds backwards, I'd like you to consider the time you swapped from your family. They had to take a back seat while you devoted yourself to your friend and her millions of problems or your online community. For example, I've seen some women who basically live on their phones. They are always talking to other people, even when they are with people. They are carrying on two barely coherent conversations at once, or they're ignoring the family in the car with them. When did our society prioritize phone calls over face-to-face talking and friendships over family interactions? However, when a woman commits herself to the raising of her children and care of her husband and home, she gets vilified as a lazy person who's wasting away at home or as a doormat whose husband will trade her in when she gets old, as if the goal of most of our lives isn't to take care of our people and our things. One would think this woman would be praised for not burdening others with her responsibilities. But because these tasks are farmed out across many professions, the one to whom the job actually belongs gets kicked out of the home so others can earn money from doing what she would provide from her heart, taking from her family's resources instead of sowing into her family as she would. We all know of some grandmother who has raised her children and is now having to raise the grandchildren because her own child is irresponsible or unavailable. We always feel a measure of sympathy for this woman. Becoming indifferent towards most things and relationships became a good place to land for me. This approach assures that I won't become too enamored with the specialness of being important to other people. I've become balanced in reality, knowing that people can love me without having to devote themselves to me full time, while also not completing shutting myself off from meaningful connections and experiences, striving for a healthy detachment. I found this frees me up to be able to love with a pure heart and not out of feigned love because I owe it. We live in a society of hyperinflated infatuation with feelings and emotions that demands constant attention and validation from others. It can be exhausting trying to keep up with everyone's expectations and their constant seeking of external validation. So I practice emotional distance. But that doesn't mean being cold and uncaring. It means recognizing that I can't control how others perceive me or what they think of me. It also means letting go of the need to constantly please others. Because as the Apostle Paul said, For am I now seeking the favor of people or of God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. The ones who were not greedy for my attention were the ones to whom I was to give it. Now, hear me out. I do not mean to imply that you ought not care about other people. But at what point has being there for somebody completely zapped your sanity? We are instructed to pour out our life for others upon the service of their faith. If teaching the gospel and the Christian walk is not what you are doing, then discipline yourself to do what the Lord has called you to. 
You are a woman. He has given you detailed instructions on how to walk worthy before him. Because we misunderstand scripture, we will rush headlong into pursuits that have nothing to do with our walk and in turn produces no real fruit. A pastor once said, family is God to you people. And I felt that. In a real sense, my duties to my extended family far surpassed what was reasonable, and I had to take a hard look at my life. I was forfeiting my duties to my Savior and elevating duties to man. I had no time to invest heavily in my marriage and motherhood because friendship and other relationships were all-consuming. This might come as a surprise to you, but... You get no reward by being the best friend or cousin or niece you can be. God left no instructions on those relationships. Not that we should ignore them, but they cannot be the most important goals we pursue. They are the easy ones because they don't really require our input. He will, however, try your motherhood and your wifehood by fire because the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. He has been very clear about how we should conduct ourselves during our stay here. Be wise to be sure life is not built with only wood, hay, and straw. Only those relationships done by His power and His strength for His glory will stand. Finding a balance that allows me to bring forth fruit for the kingdom is key. I want to show myself as an example of those who believe, disciplining myself for the purpose of godliness. Because for this I labor and strive, having set my hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. As a wife and mother, rather than be all involved in the world's way of socializing, I make it my ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to my own business and work with my hands that I may behave properly toward outsiders. In wisdom, having my speech seasoned with grace, this is more profitable to my Lord and I want to walk worthy. In what ways have you had to take a hard look at the type of service you are rendering on behalf of outsiders to the detriment of the will of the Lord for you as a wife and mother? I'd love to hear about it below in the comment section. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker. And today, let's talk about dads and their children. I love so much to pick my husband's brain. He is a wealth of information, and I always feel like I've taken a master class after talking with him. I'm always fascinated to hear that men are much different than women and how they think and how they respond and what they desire. One day, while we were stringing up pepper plants, I asked him, what happened to dads and their kids? Like, why is it the worst relationship ever? Why are they so angry and harsh? Is he disappointed with his children? So he began to tell me what goes on in men's minds concerning their kids. I'd like to share some of it with you. I actually said, hold on, hold on. Let me get my tablet so I can take notes because my friends are going to want to hear this. I want to preface that these are my husband's thoughts on what it was like for him when he was an angry dad and that this advice may not apply to all men. I want you to ask your husband his take on why dads are angry all the time with their children. So first, Brandon said, angry dads are unhappy with their own lot in life. It doesn't mean it's a bad life. He's just unhappy with how it is. He can change it himself. He just needs to acknowledge to himself that his life has not turned out how he wanted it to be. He can change his heart and his way of thinking. That's why he's angry. He can change. He needs to change. But he was not aware that it was that simple. He can change things in a drastic way if he changes himself and his outlook on life. He's upset all the time about anything, just mad. Life isn't how he wants it to be. He said a man wants to enjoy his life, but it's hard. Everything used to be all about him, and now it's not, and that's stressful. He's aware of it all. It's a hard part of life. He said men are tired. They are trying to be good husbands, and that takes up a lot of his thoughts and time. Or maybe he's injured and can't even provide how he wants to. 
He says he needs reassurance when he's down, that he's done well, and that everyone respects him. My husband said that it goes from bad to worse because the kids don't really respect their dads, so he gets mad at them and lashes out, at them and at her. Nobody wants to respect him. Then she takes their side and he just looks like a failure all around. Brenda said he already feels like a failure. It's deep inside of him and they validate that every time they don't respect his wishes. He says his children are his greatest accomplishment and he feels worse when they don't champion him as their dad. Dads want to know that they're important to their children too. But remember, he will struggle to show he cares either way. And I get it. When I'm dissatisfied with my life, I also struggle to be kind and sympathetic and forgiving. And instead, I raise my voice and cause problems for everyone. And we all know how frustrated we feel when the children don't listen to us or take their time in obeying us. We get very angry about that and we let them know, right? Next, Brandon said men need help on how he deals with the children. He needs guidance when he becomes too much. He says the provoking them to anger happens when he is in his own sin. When a man is in his sin, he blinds himself to being kind and sympathetic. So he needs help from the softer one on how to be that way towards the kids, just like us wives need help on how to be tougher on the children. He's more sad about the relationship because it's not working out how he wants it. He can get upset about things, but he's not just deeply disappointed in the children. He says he doesn't hate them. It's just surface level anger. A broken relationship makes it hard to connect. Brandon says that men know they are wrong for being angry all the time. He says it's justified to get angry sometimes, but he knows that he's always angry. And that's a problem he struggles to get out of. That he shouldn't be, but he feels like it's his house and he can be mad if he wants to. He doesn't want to deal with emotions, so he fights them by yelling at the children he feels a lot of men are upset about their lives. They don't have the money they want or everyone's complaining. He suggested that a way that we can help as wives is that if he comes across as harsh but not abusive, let it happen. He says that as a wife, I can let it happen, but then talk to him in private and encourage him to correct it. He says to be prepared because your man will get mad, but that as his wife, you know how to deliver the message. Don't go around him and explain to the kids that daddy didn't mean to laugh at you. He says that he has to do it and that a big part is knowing the Lord because the Lord will build him up to humble himself and fix the problem. At this point, I asked if build him up was the right phrase. He said, yes, dads have to practice humility too by being built up to come down in humility. He says it's a hard thing for men to be like a woman in terms of softness. He has to master himself. He says his roughness doesn't work all the time and that men know this. They know it will work for some things, but he gets embarrassed after messing up and now the kids are crying. Brandon says he masks himself with hardness because he doesn't know how to come back from it. So she has to help him. He needs help, just like children need her help. But it has to be masculine softness. He says it won't look how women might want it to look, but it is still softness from a man. So help him, but let him do it his way. Even with you, he said, husbands need help when he messes up with you. Making sure the people in his care are happy is ingrained in him. And when they are not happy, he knows it's his fault, especially if he caused the happiness to go away. Help him have a chance to make it right. Brandon says that even if everyone is mad or sad for a reason not concerning him, it's still his fault and he should have done better. Making decisions for the family is one of the ways he tries to prevent sadness from even touching them. And if they listen to him, they will be cared for. But if they don't, he says men, real men, know that it's still their fault and it's up to them to fix it. I don't understand these ways of how he thinks, but it's how he thinks. He understands it. 
And so it's not a problem to take his word for it. This is fascinating to me also because I'm the kind of person where I don't really want to take responsibility. If somebody is mad and it has something to do with me, I feel like that's on you. So to hear that he has this integrity that I find missing within my own self is very interesting and very refreshing. Because I have my own ways with dealing with things. It might not make sense to men because you all know when they try to help us, we bite their heads off, even though we may need the help. We just, we have to go through it the way we go through it. And men do too. So we should cut them some slack. So as his wife, you are already supposed to see to it that you respect him. Then you model that respect to your children, teaching them about their father's position of leadership and importance in the family. One way I do this is by spending time while Brandon is working, telling our daughter all about him. I share things he said to me about her, funny facts about him she might not know, and basically just make sure he's known to her. I also like to explain to her what it means when he isn't joking around so much when we are in public, telling her that he is in protective mode at that time, making sure she and I are safe. I let her know that he wouldn't want to appear to strangers that he is unconcerned about us, lest he make our family a target. We talk about why it's important for her to do what he says when he says it, because it's part of his job to consider her and make specific decisions for her safety and comfort, and that she can absolutely put her full trust in him. I also remind her that it is a command from the Lord, and she owes it to God to do what God says. I remind her how he has corrected me dozens of times throughout the years when I was negligent in my parenting or too harsh with my criticisms and instructions to her. He would command me to lower my tone or be careful of my anger lest I crush her spirit. It's important for her to know these things about him that he protects her even from my anger and sinfulness. I also make sure that she is aware when he's trying to be sweet to her by offering to take her shopping whenever she wants new art supplies or swinging by her favorite restaurant when she's had a tough week, that he's reaching out to her in love, that when he asks if she wants to go with him, he's letting her know he wants her company. These little talks happen throughout the day, and I always let her know when her words or actions have honored him. I like to invest in the relationship, and this is one of the ways that I do that as his wife. He isn't hands-off and unaware. These things I do are extras. They are not what his relationship with his daughter hinges upon. Just little helps to put him in a good light in her eyes. And not to fool her, he really is an amazing husband and dad, and she needs to know that. Another important thing I do is that when I bring a grievance to him, I state what I feel happened that made me unhappy, but also make sure he understands I am not telling him how to fix it or what to do, but just that I'm unhappy with how it all went down. That way, I leave space for him to come to his own conclusions as to what he did and how he would like to fix it. And I tell him after he makes amends, if he chooses to do so, that I appreciate his kindness towards her. These things help build him up for the next time and helps him keep his heart soft towards his daughter and towards me as well. Encouragement from a wife might come across in a stern but soft way, reassuring him, you are the man, babe, you're the one everyone is looking to, and that he does have the right to dictate things in his family. These things will boost him up and encourage him to take on his own life and make changes. Ask your husband why men struggle with their relationship with the children and let us know what he thinks down below in the comments section. I'm sure he's a wise man who has much to say about this topic. I'd love to hear about it. Hey guys, this is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about obedience. We all know what the Word of God says. A big area of contention in my life was not doing what my husband asked, or I was modifying it into something I wouldn't mind doing, or questioning him. He calls it questioning. I just call it asking questions, or demanding to be heard before he decides what he's going to do. I learned that it's about choices I make every day to deny the flesh and its desires and instead do what is right without being frightened by fear. 
fear that I won't have what I need, fear that things are going to go wrong and we're all going to suffer. Those were fears that I had. They weren't valid. They were just there. It took some time to train myself to do what I was asked to do, and I learned quickly that my obedience has lots of limits, things I wasn't happy to do or willing to do, so I worked hard to push that line farther and farther away. I had become a person who couldn't be instructed, and that was incompatible with being a Christian wife. Let me tell you a true account of an incident involving myself. There was an issue I had been complaining about for a few weeks, and my husband decided that he would take on the task for me, which was indeed a tremendous help. I felt free and unburdened. So I was mentioning to someone in the conversation that I didn't have, you know, XYZ anymore, and they offered to let me use theirs. I declined and said, oh no, it's a small thing. It's not a problem at all, because it really wasn't. Well, a few weeks went by and then I got a call on my daughter's cell phone about the particular item for sale for $60. So I agreed to buy it. And then I called my husband to tell him the good news. And he said, no, he didn't want to get it. I was silent. Then I said in a very quiet voice, okay, bye. (laughs) As soon as I hung up, the battle began. Here's what was happening in my mind. It's 60 bucks. I know he got it. I already told her I would get it. She knows I need it. And now I'm going to look stupid for refusing this amazing offer. I hope they don't think we're poor. Jack, he said, no, he is already handling this. He has a whole plan. Yeah, a stupid plan. I'm suffering. I feel like I can't even take care of my family. I should call her back right now before she tells the other person that I'll get it. But uh, why is he saying no? It's not like I don't have money left in my household account. I could use that. It wouldn't even have to come out of his pocket. It would just simplify things again. But no, he he said no. And he's been handling this and he doesn't need me to rescue him. I haven't had to actually do anything in this regard because he's taking care of it. So why am I getting so upset about this? Uh, How can I say it in a text message? That way she won't be able to ask me any questions and she'll probably just say, okay, like she always does when she gets a text, but how to say it? Um, okay. Uh, Brandon says he doesn't want to. No, no, wait, that'll sound like I want it. and He's being mean. Um, how about, how about I say, can you get it for me and just hold on to, wait, wait, that's not right. I'm not doing that. He already told me to stop committing us to stuff without discussing it with him. Why? This doesn't even concern him. But yeah, it does because he would have to leave work early to go get it, install it. And I would just watch the whole process. But what's wrong with that? I do tons of stuff. He just watches me do. Okay. Okay. (laughs) This is getting into dangerous territory. Let me pray and take captive my thoughts. So I did. I prayed and confessed my desire to override my husband's decision, my desire to lie in order to save myself from embarrassment. I acknowledged that I tried to make a way for myself and that I nearly instigated a rebellion against my husband's leadership in my own heart. I turned my back on those sins and reminded my flesh that I am an obedient wife and I will support Brandon's plans for his family. Woo! It was a long prayer, guys. (laughs) But afterwards, I had Haley send this text. We won't be getting the XYZ, but thanks anyway. Then I called my husband to tell him I was sorry for being short on the phone earlier and that I was back under control. A few days later, that person came by and was talking about what a great deal it was and how it was too good to pass up and why in the world didn't Brandon want it right in front of him. Because my husband is a gracious man, he didn't respond, but just picked up her baby to walk around because she didn't understand that she was questioning a man about running his own household. So I answered and said, He decided he didn't want to go that route. And he's been taking care of this area. He does great. I have nothing to do with it because he takes care of it. And whatever he wants to do is fine with me. Oh, and look at the sweet baby and her pretty shoes. Did you do her hair? 
And that was it. I didn't have to lie or exaggerate nothing. No one knew the intense battle that took place that day in my mind, but I remembered, and I was so thankful I mastered myself. I could have used my power of persuasion to convince him to buy the thing. I could have berated his decision to his face. I could have even used the old, what if this is the Lord providing conversation. It's so easy to throw that gem out whenever it's convenient for me. Who knows? Maybe it was. Maybe it was God providing. But to use that to justify why my idea was right is manipulation. And I will have no part in using God's providence to deceive my husband. To this day, he hasn't complained once. He hasn't messed anything up and I haven't gotten in his way. Peace is able to reign because I didn't allow my pride to entice me to sin. I got close though, which caused me sorrow, especially when I tell you when all of this went down. It was just a few weeks ago back in May. (laughs) Tell me about a time you did war against the flesh when you knew it was enticing you to sin. I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about womanhood. As we strive to draw closer to the Lord, we run across lots of teachings that seem to help guide us in the right way. More pamphlets, more books, more devotionals, all designed to offer help. But where does our help come from? From the Lord. The Bible says. So, because he wants us to come to him, I turn my back on two specific popular techniques that don't really help in purity, but instead give me reason to boast in self. The first is affirmations. I am so utterly sick of affirmation teachings. Nowhere in scriptures are we called to do this. God instructs us to meditate on his precepts day and night. If this is what you do during your affirmation time, why not just call it what God calls it? Why use a worldly touch phrase to do spiritual things? But most likely, the affirmations being done are worldly ones, mostly designed to tamp down impulses like guilt, fear, and discouragement, or to boost up your morale or adoration of self and all its power, or to even boost your faith in God, all without using the Bible. I remember being involved in something like this about 12, 13 so years ago, and after completing the whole 30-day ritual, that didn't work because, remember, my motive was to make something happen through my prayers. I searched around for a few more to try out. This sounds so silly saying it out loud. A few years later, I was actually amazed that what I had recited wasn't actual scriptures, but just affirmative statements. There is no power in paraphrased quotes. I didn't know because at the time in my walk, you know, those 13, 12 years ago, I had never read an entire chapter all the way through. My pastor jumped around and I don't ever recall him encouraging me to read the word chapter by chapter, book by book. So I had no idea if what I was saying was actually scripture. Affirmations are words spoken in the positive that are designed to challenge bad thoughts. New age people professing Christianity take this on and say, oh, well, our kind is biblical and it brings us closer to God. Well, the the Bible does that already, right? Why do a whole carnal thing to justify drawing closer to God? There are many who Christian wash things to make them useful and available to Christians. I don't even need to name them because some of them include major holidays celebrated in pagan ways, but I'm moving on because we can circle back to that in a different video. The word of God is the standard for all truth and affirmations may lie and distort sayings that align mostly with the current culture and some new to the faith may be unable to distinguish between those two differences. Of course, those who have walked longer with the Lord will be able to discern correctly the subtlety of Satan's agenda. 
These worldly affirmations also tend to focus on what we can do or what we are supposed to get from God and how much God is for our success and prosperity. They flatter us with sweet sayings, making us feel like we can take on the whole world. But Jesus says he has overcome the world. Why should we concern ourselves with the fight he has already won? These things have no place in Christianity. They are truly the antithesis of what we are instructed to do. We are not to trust in ourselves, but in God. We are not to rely on our own strength, but to glory in our weakness. We are not to use powerful statements to get rid of fear and slothfulness, but we are told that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So affirmations or paraphrasings written by random people are the very definition of carnality. We have to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, not just shut them up so we can finish our work for the day. Quotes in and of themselves aren't bad. They are soothers, not weapons of war. We are to lean not upon our own understanding or the understanding of Melanie or Alicia, who has a whole bundle of beautiful parables for your war room walls. (laughs) There are some affirmations that seem to exalt God, and that's fine, I guess. I personally would rather read and understand actual scripture and let the Holy Spirit highlight whatever he desires to bring about in my life. Because all I know is that when Jesus was tempted by Satan, He didn't use some girl power, well, boy power affirmation. He used the very word of the very God that is sharper than any two-edged sword. All right, since I already got you fired up, I guess I'll tell you a second thing I abstain from. Prayer war rooms. Prayer war rooms are another beast I avoid. I am not interested in creating this beautiful space to show other people online or in person how I put on my display of holiness and devotion. If we were told to pray in secret, wouldn't showing the prayer place itself be a contradiction? I'd rather, which I know, I know the place is not the prayer. I I know that. (laughs) But it just seems like, like, are you really going to just open the door and say, look, and then shut it back? No, are you going to give a tour and everything? We all know. Anyway, I'd rather just find a quiet corner or a space outside and pour out my heart to God. I know he sees me there. My thoughts are so scattered and I struggle to focus, but I trust that God hears the cries of my heart, even when my words fail and there are no pretty pictures on the wall with uplifting statements. I understand these rooms can sometimes be used by true believers who need a quiet space to meet with God, but I fear that the majority of rooms shown are places to showcase artistic style. I even saw a pastor, and I'm using that word very lightly. He was showing his prayer closet. It was literally lined with expensive shoes and bright lights to showcase his collection. Uh, I laugh now, but I felt some righteous anger initially. I've come across teachings that say the prayer room is, and I quote, it's modeled after the prayer warrior in the Bible, Hannah, who poured out her heart to God in a manner so intense that her prayers were mistaken for drunkenness. Well, that's an interesting statement. I said interesting, but I meant incorrect considering that Hannah's lips moved as she prayed in her heart, but no words were spoken aloud, and that Eli mistook her for being drunk. Eli, that same worthless priest who allowed his sons to defile the priesthood and assumed wrongly that this virtuous woman was in fact wickedly drunk. So basing a prayer room off of his error seems like a recipe for disaster at best and works righteousness at worst. Listen, a godly woman is not only passionate, prayerful, presenting her requests to God, but a godly woman is pure. Her motives are known by the Lord, and he has said, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. I sure hope they do not enter before the throne of the majesty on high with sinful motives, emulating what they have seen on a movie, hoping to become some prayer warrior. 
but that's between her and the Lord. I don't even want to get started on those who keep detailed and extensive records of prayers that they share with anyone who will listen. I want to assume that their motives are pure. Nothing wrong at all about talking about the working of God in your prayer life. But at what point is this story about us and our robust prayer life? Again, another topic for another day. Lastly, I don't think there is a need for these creative things. They are not necessary for having a relationship with the Lord. These practices are infiltrating traditional Christianity and has become yet another way to show something, feel something, have something to boast in. Let me know what your thoughts are on these two subjects down below in the comment section. Remember, we don't have to agree. These are trivial things. So feel free to share your experience, good or bad. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker. And today, let's talk about motherhood. Are you afraid of your children? I will admit, I get afraid of my daughter sometimes. I mean, not that she beats me or anything, <laughs> but that I know how impressionable children are. In my mind, I have all of my own childhood fears and issues, and I am mindful of what she'll say about her childhood in the future. One fear that I had was that she would hate me. We are basically told that teenage daughters hate their mothers, and I began to prepare myself for that so-called fact. So in order to try to prevent that from becoming our story, I tried to do everything to keep her happy. I didn't want to cause her any distress, especially since she's a highly sensitive person. I wanted to be perfect so that when she reminisced about her childhood, she wouldn't have anything bad to say about me. But that is a horrible way to raise a child. And there's no example of that in scripture. The big thing is that I did not want to be the villain in her version of her childhood. My heart hurts to even think of the reality that there absolutely will be things she hates about her childhood and she will most likely blame me. Another thing I feared was driving her into becoming an angry person. My childhood was typical, I'd imagine, and like we all say, I wanted to make sure I didn't repeat the sins of my parents. I wanted to be a parent who remembered what it was like to be a kid to help me keep in touch with her reality. So I tried my best not to discipline her. Well, after the toddler years, anyway. When I came home with her full time when she was five, almost six, and we were shut up in our 400 square foot house together with our sin, it became a whole different story. I found myself afraid of using the belt because I knew a lot of my anger was from being overwhelmed or distracted or I was going to go overboard. So I was afraid of hitting her. But that isn't a biblical way to raise a child either. Even to this day, after 10 years of being with her basically 24 hours a day, I still feel my heart having fear on how to work alongside her. Training a child as well as a disciple is hard work. There's a balance of child and sister in Christ that I struggle with. At what point am I just mom who's angry at something she did? Or when is it loving correction from a joint heir in Christ? No, really, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Let me know what your take is down in the comment section. I really want to know. So I struggle with fear that she will be upset with me or overburdened with all of my teaching. I wonder if she's binding my instructions about her neck, if she's forsaking the instruction of her mother and her father, if she is battling her fleshly desires and taking hold of Christ. I want to talk with her about her life as a teen in Christ, but will the mom and me distinguish between growing pains and willful rebellion? I look at her growing and forming her own opinions and standards that sometimes don't align with scripture, and I struggle to simply show her God's standards and then walk away. She has to have her own liberty to live a life. 
the society she's growing up in is much different than the one I grew up in. And I'm not sure that it's right to stuff her into a mold that's familiar to me. And also, I only know salvation as an adult. I've never really seen it in a child before. And so I want to be sober-minded about her confession, looking for evidence of regeneration in her life. I understand the very real danger of accepting a confession from a child who hasn't really been born again, and how parents will sometimes convince themselves that the confession did, in fact, lead to conversion and salvation. I think we do that as parents because it helps us sleep better at night if we feel assured that they are not going to perish in hell. We might miss the reality of a lack of proof of their conversion and instead approve them ourselves. We blame the quote-unquote backsliding on children being children taking our stand on our own witness of their confession, ignoring the obvious signs of a lack of conformity to Christ and our children. So what did Christ look like as a child? I go back and read the account of when Jesus went home with Joseph and Mary. And it says, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. So this is the scripture I mainly use for teaching my daughter about her life in Christ. I know that there are other ones, but this is the one I use mainly about her life in Christ. We talk about how in this society, children have a freedom unheard of before. I mean, they have cool devices, their own social platforms. They have access to money. I remember searching for change in the couch cushions so that I can get some penny candy as a kid. But these days, kids have their own bank accounts and credit cards. It's crazy. (laughs) They have sports teams structured out for them. When we used to just go outside and play, like we would just make up games. But they have to have teams and jerseys and (laughs) coaches, all of this stuff. Anyway, they're encouraged to protest to question authority, challenge the rules of society, and speak their mind any place that has a comment section. But what did Jesus' childhood look like? The Bible doesn't go into detail, which I'm, I'm glad for, but we do know it has order and subjection. It said Jesus submitted himself to his parents. He didn't rule them, didn't demand his own way and rights and privileges, but he put himself, and did you catch that? He put himself under subjection to his parents. So we asked our daughter to do the same. In this age and society of live and let live, freedom, do all the things, we asked her to put her life in subjection to her parents, to trust us to lead her, to let us train her in the way she should go, to subject herself to our rules and regulations. We explain that we cannot force her to do it, but we do expect her to imitate Christ. But she herself has to be willing to subject herself to her parents. She says that it's tough to, that there is a lot of influence online that she struggles to reject. She says she feels the struggle within herself, that she knows what she should do, but that the doing of it is tough. As her mother, I sympathize with her, and I have to make sure that I do not relieve her of her struggles myself. She has to walk her path, same as me, but I get it. I, too, as a wife, had to learn to subject myself to my own husband. Hey, guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today, let's talk about marriage. A lot of my time in my marriage initially was spent trying to fix my husband because he was obviously broken. I would cut up, yell, scream, accuse, and point out his failings with no mercy. Whenever he would storm out of the house, I would then turn to the Lord to pray. Not to submit myself to God confessing my sins, but instead to get him on my side. My prayers sounded a bit like this. Lord, 
I want a happy marriage, but he refuses to stop hurting me. I'm hurting so bad, and I just want it all to stop. Show him, Lord. Show him how he's destroying our marriage. Please, God, do this. He needs you. I need you. And so on and so on. Then I learned that I needed to pray for myself instead. So my prayers began to sound like this. God, I try so hard. I stop following him around, berating him. I don't deny him when he wants to spend time with me. I do everything around here. I make sure I teach our daughter. He doesn't even care about her soul. I get books for us to read, but he refuses because he is not interested in saving our relationship. I don't know why he's so stiff-necked. I don't know why he hates progress. Why does he act like this? I hate <laughs> I hate so much the way he chooses to be. <laughs> ah. Lord, what more can I do? I've done the Titus 2 stuff and nothing is working. I probably should just wash my hands of him. Give me a reason to stay, God. Do you see how I changed from trying to fix him to listing all of my deeds before God? Yeah, that didn't work out as well either. So I turned to the 1 Peter 3 woman. The NASB version says, in the same way, you wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won over without a word by the behavior or conversation in the King James of their wives as they observe your pure and respectful behavior or chase conversation coupled with fear in the King James. So I began to try to be more quiet. Usually I remembered after I had already engaged and fired off a few quick shots. Then I tried to put the scripture into practice, but that was an obvious manipulation tactic. He saw right through that and rightly accused me of being a hypocrite. So then after many failures, I learned to put it into practice before I took out my guns. It helped um, sometimes, but guess what my motives were? I wanted to show him that I was better than him and above arguing, that I was more pious than he was and didn't need to stoop so low as to get upset. I became the most gracious woman I have ever been in that moment. I would fix his dinner with the sweetest smile on my face because I knew a secret that he didn't. I was going to change him by being ultra nice and respectful. He didn't know it, but me and God were going to fix his butt. I was thinking, I don't even have to say anything. God's going to get him. My self-righteousness was very evident. In my mind, I skipped over a very important word in that scripture. I heard the scripture like this in my mind. When my husband is disobedient to the word. But the text didn't say that. The text said, even if any of them are disobedient. Ding! The light bulb went off. In that moment, I realized first that God knew men make mistakes, but I refused to allow my husband to be human and make mistakes. I also realized, most importantly, that I wasn't supposed to put on this behavior when I noticed he was acting a fool. It was supposed to be my actual behavior as a whole. So that even if he's out of line, not loving me like Christ, refusing to lead the family, I can just keep on being the respectful, quiet, chaste wife I always am. And that he'll see for himself that he's being an idiot. <laughs> Not that I think he's an idiot. And that wasn't the purpose of why I needed to change my behavior. But he'll come to a conclusion similar to that himself as he observes me. This verse was designed to get me to focus on myself, which is kind of ironic. Normally, we are always thinking about ourselves, except when we want our own way. We then think much, much more about everyone else and why they need to change. Anyway, 
I learned that I needed to focus on getting myself in order. I was not respectful as a rule. I had no fear in how I spoke to the man in authority over myself. I spoke my mind freely and often. Those things needed to change. But not in order to manipulate him, but in order to get myself in line with the word of God, because that two by four in my own eye was blocking me from getting that speck out of Brandon's eye. I needed to practice self-control and learn to give honor to whom honor was due. So I got busy working on myself, fixing my thoughts, my reactions to my husband, my inner thought life, all the things, and I took my eyes off of my husband. I say all of this to encourage you to search your own heart and see your motives. Say with David, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Beseech God to get deep into your heart to expose those hidden motives and bring them to the surface to be tested by fire because your new desire has to become to have a clean heart before the Lord. Confess the wily ways of your heart, the deceit and manipulation that was hiding and driving your reactions to your husband. Then, with a clean heart, do the Lord's will in your life. Become chaste in your conversation. Fear your husband with a holy fear as unto the Lord, meaning that you need to treat him with utmost respect and honor as the one who will give an account concerning you. And let God work on your husband. He's much better at it than you could ever be because you want your husband changed for you, but God wants him changed for Christ's sake. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unborn Homemaker. And today, let's talk about marriage. Being married is not all about us. It is about the Lord. Marriage is the grace of life a picture of Christ and his church, and it is an avenue through which the Lord conforms us to Christ. Christian wives get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach because the word of God is her instruction. Christian wives are submissive because God's word commands them to be. Christian wives are obedient to their own husbands because the word of God commands them to be. Christian wives work on cultivating a quiet and gentle spirit because it is precious and of great price in the sight of God. Christian wives don't eat the bread of idleness because God's word set the example for us to follow. Christian wives are not busybodies going from house to house being idle because the word of God instructs them to disdain such practices. Christian wives make a claim to godliness because they desire to be holy because God is holy. Christian wives cover their bodies because the word of God instructs them to. Christian wives love their children because God's word commands them to. Christian wives see to it that they reverence their husbands because the word of God commands them to. Christian wives have the trust of their husbands because she does him good and not evil according to the word of God. Christian wives look well to the ways of their households, bringing in the increase because the word of God set an example for her to follow. Christian wives open their mouths in wisdom and teach kindness with their tongues because they belong to the Lord. Christian wives clothe themselves with strength and dignity and have no fear of the winter because their faith is in the Lord. Christian wives hope in God 
because who else is like our God? Christian wives are sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Christian wives are reverent in behavior and not slanderers because they are being conformed to Christ. Christian wives have chaste behaviors coupled with fear, being pure and respectful in their interactions with their husbands as women who glorify God. Christian wives are not overly concerned with outward adorning, beauty, and charm, but are exalting God by being daughters of Sarah. Christian wives help the poor and needy and shows hospitality to the stranger because she is a servant of God. Christian wives are praised by their husbands and children because they see her faithful and loving devotion to the Lord and to themselves. Christian wives deny ungodliness and worldly desires and desire to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age because they are looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Let me know down below what you would add to this list as a Christian wife. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about distress. I have been feeling tremendously overwhelmed with the summer heat, the clutterness of my home, the failure of my crops, the discontentment within my heart, and I've murmured against the Lord's providence, became fretful and anxious, and basically taken my eyes off the Lord. Words fail me at times, so I turn to the Psalms to help me speak what I fail to express. My heart says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. I feel the desire of my tongue to complain and bitterness, but I've said, I will guard my ways, that I may not sin with my tongue. So I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. My heart becomes hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. But still now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. It is so easy to turn to the world seeking comfort, but there is none to be had for the righteous. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague and my kinsmen stand afar off. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and do not let them rejoice over me, but let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication, and let them say continually, the Lord be magnified. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. As for me, inside I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. This poor woman cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me out of all my troubles. Save me according to your loving kindness, and let them know that this is your hand. You, Lord, have done it. May your compassion come to me that I may live. I consider my ways and turn my feet to your testimonies. I beseech thee, do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinance. This is my comfort in my affliction that your word has revived me.
I remember your ordinances from of old, O Lord, and comfort myself. I ask only that you turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. My heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. I will give you thanks with all my heart, for you have magnified your word according to all your name. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. I love to turn to the word to help me search my heart and rend it before the throne of grace. I use many verses from Psalms using the NASB version. Accepting gifts was a challenge to me due to my belief that receiving gifts meant I had to reciprocate. This belief made me come across as ungrateful as I failed to recognize that some gifts are given out of pure generosity, requiring no strings, while others may necessitate a form of repayment. Learning to distinguish between these types of gifts has helped me become a more appreciative and gracious recipient, even if it costs me something. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about womanhood. I was tired of being ungrateful and feeling stuck having to pay back a gift. I found it rotting my heart because while I don't mind getting gifts, <laughs> I don't like being in debt to someone. I obviously misunderstood what gifts were. Being a grateful receiver not only nourishes the spirit behind the gift, but also strengthens the bond between the giver and the recipient. I learned that it was important to approach gifts with an open heart. Understanding that some may come with certain expectations, while others are given purely out of kindness. I'd like to talk about three gifts that I have received and how I handle them. First, I receive the free gift of God in Christ. Christ's sacrifice to accomplish salvation means that he was put forth by God and it pleased God to crush him on the behalf of unworthy sinners. At the right time, Christ died for my sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring me to God. This act of being my propitiation means I have a righteousness not my own credited to my account and my own sin defeated on the cross. I didn't ask for it. I wouldn't even know how to ask for it. I can't even believe without that also being given as a gracious gift from God. God hath chosen me in him before the foundation of the world, that I should be holy and without blame before him in love. This is a gift, freely given, and able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Christ, our Savior and Lord. I accepted this free gift when I came to him and believed that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Because I accept this free gift, I have peace with God through Christ and can come boldly before his throne of grace. This is the best gift I've ever received, one that I can never repay or boast that I did something to earn it. And for that, I am exceedingly thankful. The next gift I received was an offer of marriage. This type of gift was a kindness to me. I wasn't worthy, I felt, to have a man pledge his life to me. I mean, I wanted it, I desired it, but I didn't really think it would happen for me. Although I was a vile and wicked sinner, I wanted something to go right for me. My husband humbled me in that he knew my past, the scandalous reputation I had created for myself, and yet he still wanted to call me his own. I had no skills, no loyalty, and yet I had his heart. He offered his life, his love, and his home to me, and it was truly a gift. This gift does come with some type of repayment. We set vows before God to be joined together and to not be departed. 
we pledge to have and to hold, to be there in sickness and in health. I promise to obey and love him all the days of my life. This type of gift repayment is one I pursue every day. Because I see his gift of marriage as a kindness, I don't mind paying him back. He exercises his love and devotion, his provision and his care. He holds me and honors me and does his duty towards me, his body being mine and my body being his. We are one flesh and joint heirs of the grace of life. Our marriage is a picture of what Christ is to his church. This is my second favorite gift I have received, the one by which I am growing in sanctification, being refined by fire, and for that, I am thankful. And finally, I received a seed to nurture alongside Brandon in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This was a gift because I struggled to maintain my pregnancies. Haley was our fourth pregnancy. I was stunned to learn that motherhood might not be in the cards for me. I just assumed that I would do as women have always done and bear children. In my fallen flesh, I wanted to prevent pregnancy. But after my conversion, I wanted to be fruitful and multiply. But it wasn't easy. We prayed and beseeched the Lord to bless us. Our former prayer team stood in the gap, offering up prayers to the Lord that he might be gracious. And behold, the Lord answered our prayer. We also desired a daughter most of all, and the Lord also honored that prayer. It was a gift, one that also requires repayment of sorts. We are to dedicate her, as well as our own lives, to the Lord, training her in the way she should go, teaching about the Holy God of Israel, the Ancient One who made all things by Him and through Him and for Him, Christ His Son, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We teach her about the risen Savior who bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. She learns about the Holy Spirit who searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Same power that the Father used to raise Jesus from the dead is at work in us and who helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. We are careful to remind her that we serve a jealous God, one full of wrath against the ungodly, who will drink the full cup of his wrath, the Holy One that will by no means clear the guilty, and that from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. We tell her about the one who says, I am the Lord, which exercise love and kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. We are to pour out our lives as drink offerings upon the sacrifice and service of her faith, the gift that requires our faithfulness, but most importantly, our trust in God to take our feeble efforts and glorify himself in her life. And for this gift, I am most humbled, full of fear and trembling, and also very thankful. So you see, there are many types of gifts to receive. I pray you recognize your gifts and walk accordingly as one purchased by God. Let me know down below what special gifts you have received. I love to hear about it in the comment section below. As children, we only see what we see. We are selfish people. It's a fact. No adult in their right mind would expect children to consider things from someone else's perspective naturally. Those traits are taught to them. In the age of psychiatrists and therapy, we tend to side with the psychological method of dealing with our childhood. But as a born-again believer, I don't support that viewpoint. Inflating our own importance will cause us to forget that God is the offended party in everyone's story. We offend Him and must become new creations before we can ever do actual good towards others. Every effort made 
by every person ever is flawed. People do things for their own interests, their own lusts, their own desires, their own benefit. Yes, the other person might get some gain out of it too, but first and foremost, sinners take care of themselves. They will never do anything from a selfless position. They want to win and gain at all costs. And if they do actually lose, they will make sure someone else loses too. But wisdom from the Lord and life experience teaches us that there is always another story to it. When you accepted the unconditional forgiveness from God the Father, you rejoiced. And it is wrong to receive much forgiveness and not offer much forgiveness. Yes, your parents hurt you. Your childhood was a nightmare. Your innocence was destroyed. But you were also a sinner who deserved it. Sinners weren't promised a peaceful, pain-free childhood. Worldly wisdom tells you that you are robbed, that your parents live their life to make you miserable, and that they can never make right what was wrong. But remember the true offended party. You live all of your life hating God, because that's what his word says. You hated him. You were free in regards to righteousness, and your thoughts were continually evil. And if your parents were not true believers, true, then they might have had a form of godliness or not, but they were in fact full sinners, just like you. They messed up. They were selfish. Their hearts loved sin and sinning just like you did. And God forgave you. Your lying will send you to hell just like murder and rape. Your putting gods before the true and living God is just as bad as homosexuality and coveting. So if you can't pay back all the sin and hatred you had, but in fact accepted Christ's finished work on the cross as forgiveness for your sins, how about you cut the sinners in your life a little slack? They have much bigger problems than you. They don't have peace with God. Wisdom teaches us that when we were children, we only saw our point of view. We never considered how hard our parents might have worked to try to raise us right, doing it all apart from the Holy Spirit, which means it was severely flawed and could have never been perfect. They couldn't master their flesh, just like you cannot, apart from the Lord's regenerating work in your life. So how can you accept all the forgiveness of the Lord, but hold on to and sit in judgment of blatant sinners who hurt you, or who didn't give you all the fleshly desires of your heart? Grow in wisdom and let this go. You are not owed any apology. You were a sinner too. Did you ever apologize for being a rude, disrespectful, disobedient child or an unkind, harsh, big sister? Or tell the truth that you were, in fact, a thief who stole from your family? Did you come clean about cheating on your tests, sneaking alcohol when your parents left for the day, cursing while you were at school with your friends, having murderous thoughts about multiple people? Probably not. The offended one is God alone. I never once considered that I hurt my parents as I flung accusations that they didn't love me in their face. I never considered that they would cry at my rejection. I was mad and I wanted them to know they failed me. I never saw them scrape together money for my birthday doing without so that I could have something, but I didn't want that crap. I yelled and screamed, and they were ashamed, and I never apologized. I just took my whooping and blamed them for abusing me. They punished me, but my sinful nature called it abuse. 
I didn't want consequences dealt to me. What sinner does? But when I looked at my daughter's face after screaming that I hate being her mother, when we were going through our first year of homeschool and my first year being home full time, I remembered that my parents also took those mally stripping words that I flung at them. I understood in that moment that all effort apart from the spirit is destructive and full of murderous hatred. All effort. An apology goes a long way, yes. But those words are already too deep. Thank God that we not only get eternal life in his presence, but he also conforms us to Christ now so that we can be better people. People who can be selfless, considerate, tender-hearted, forgiving, and merciful. Thank you for listening. I hope this helps. The old-fashioned woman didn't focus all her efforts on food, the getting, the storing, the recipe creation. She had a full life of serving her family, and to hyper-focus on one area would cause other areas to default. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about homemaking. Truly, we are all susceptible to fear. Some people are afraid of losing all their money, so they hoard it. They work burdensome hours, all in an effort to make sure they are never low on money. Others experience fear of failure, causing them to avoid taking risks and instead stay within their comfort zone. Some people are afraid of being unsuccessful, so they push themselves and their children to overachieve. Some people are terrified of being unfashionable or overweight or forgotten, so they go through excessive obsessions of dieting, binge shopping, and trying to become either famous or infamous. For the housewife, our fear has convinced us that our families will go hungry. To prevent that, we purchase food in bulk and start large burdensome gardens and raising as many animals as possible, all in an effort to make sure we won't be hungry. These are amazing plans. Being involved in the growing, harvesting, and processing of food is a noble pursuit. It nourishes you and makes you feel in touch with nature, but this has become increasingly exploited. Being afraid of hunger, I feel, is an American problem, as if getting hungry is the worst kind of evil. Hunger is temporary. Our bodies experience it, or is supposed to experience it, on small levels every day. I remember a time when I was actually terrified of getting hungry, especially when I worked outside the home. I was on a clock and there were set break times, so I would go ahead and eat to make sure I didn't get hungry. Did you hear what I said? I said I would eat to make sure I didn't get hungry. That's literally nuts. Hunger tells you to eat. I ate so hunger wouldn't talk to me. I would eat the three squares and the two snacks marketing has told me is the standard way of eating. I consume calories according to a clock instead of natural body cues. After breaking free from the madness, I now became bombarded by social media posts. Everybody's mama is an influencer and is willing to devote her life to picture-perfect pantries, which I love. Don't misunderstand me. The aesthetic of shelves laden with jars filled with homegrown food, the five-gallon buckets lining the floor, and the massive collection of rings, lids, and mylar bags seduces the housewife. She looks at this and she desires it for herself. As she collects her items, she feels absolutely wealthy. She fantasizes about walking down to her home grocery store in her basement, pulling out items for today's meal prep, and waltzing back into the kitchen to perform a miracle of homemaking wonder. Triple points are awarded if the meal contains kamut or iron corn flour or organic barley pearls. <laughs> However, 
After indulging in the sweet bulk shopping fantasy for several years, I decided that I'd rather spend my money on less but better quality food. The goal, I believe, is not to see how much food you can have at your home, as if creating your own grocery store isn't actually a weird idea. It is, by the way. One whole purpose of grocery stores is the fact that keeping all that inventory at your own home is unrealistic. What if your health changes and you want to head in a completely different avenue in terms of food? I shudder at the overindulgence of items I purchased. I was hoarding jars and lids like it was gold. And it still wasn't enough because now homemakers are freeze drying foods. Why? Why are we making these products that we've never even used to see? Like freeze dried candy and freeze dried watermelon. Come on, people. This is yet another way to get your pockets empty and your belly full. How come our recipes have evolved into merely belly fillers? I literally hear women saying things like, this meal is full of calories to make sure no one goes hungry. Has the feeding of our bodies been reduced to mere calorie consumption? How is this right? The old-fashioned woman prioritized whole foods and ensured her family was well-nourished. She didn't obsess over the details of food preparation, but saw it as part of a bigger picture, serving her family. Get single ingredients, make food with them. She believed in the power of whole foods to nourish and sustain her loved ones. Rather than getting caught up in the minutia of food preparation, she approached it with simplicity and practicality. While she was open to learning new recipes and techniques, she emphasized the importance of using single ingredients to create delicious meals. For her, cooking was just a means of serving and caring for her family, ensuring they were nourished and satisfied. I'd love to read your thoughts on the whole grocery store at home philosophy down below in the comment section. I know there are a lot of smart people here. Living the crucified life as a woman and wife means fixing our eyes firmly on our Savior and living the humbled life just as he did. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about womanhood. I pondered a lot in my heart what sharing in the humbling of Jesus Christ could mean to me as a woman and a homemaker. After all, I don't really go many places and I haven't been called to testify in front of kings and I don't have an outside ministry. Through prayer and meditating on the word, I found some interesting things. But first, what does the word humbling even mean? According to the Strong's Concordance, humbling means basically base, cast down, humble, of low degree, lowly. But when I checked a dictionary from the world's wisdom, humbling means causing someone to understand that they are not as important or special as they thought, undignified demeaning. These are two very conflicting views. The biblical way is a way of viewing yourself, and the worldview is a way to tear another person down. The world hates humility. It offends them. Self-exaltation and self-promotion are king, and only a fool would consider themselves as base, humble, and lowly. But when I read Philippians 2, it showed me that Christ had this very thing. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him. So, according to the Bible, Jesus himself became base, cast down, humble, of low degree. So, as a woman, I had to consider, in what ways can I do that? The world loves to exalt women. Women love to exalt women. It goes beyond just supporting women. And I don't want to hear the argument that the world already thinks little of women. 
The culture might hate women on one hand, but it also exalts women way above their stature, even calling them words like divine feminine or goddess. The only women they truly hate are Christian homemakers who exemplify Christlikeness. So, in an effort to humble myself for the sake of Christ, I came up with this rephrasing for my own personal use. It goes like this. I, as a woman, fully capable, fully adult and worthy, did not count equality with my husband a thing to be grasped, but instead I emptied myself, submitting to my husband, and humbled myself by becoming obedient to the man in authority over me, even to the point of death, and by death I mean the illusion of self-autonomy, or in other words, you know, denying myself, taking up my cross, that whole thing. This is Christ in me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ. The world doesn't want me to do that. They don't want me to submit myself to my husband. They are not interested in me obeying God. But at the end of the day, my obedience is what I have to answer to God for. And I want to obey. Even the man he put in authority over me. So when I examine why it's important to obey God and be holy, I notice some interesting things. For instance, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equal. And yet, Christ submitted himself and gave up his right in order to become what God wanted him to become. And as a woman, fully able to make decisions and be co-equal, but yet I submit to my husband's authority as unto the Lord. This is fascinating. Christ still possessed his godly status, but wasn't taking full advantage of it as he accomplished salvation on earth. The same is kind of true for me. Yes, of course, I can make all kinds of decisions and do whatever I so choose. But God said, submit to my husband. So that's what I do. I don't fight to keep my identity, my rights, and my independence. My husband hasn't ever even tried to make me do that in any way. He doesn't lord over me his leadership unless I get out of order and try to usurp his authority. Another thing I noticed was that Christ was infinitely rich, but became poor for our sakes. As a woman fully capable of obtaining a well-paying job, I became poor, and I depend on my husband to provide for me. Christ's value had no price tag. He didn't want credit for every single thing he did to serve humanity and accomplish salvation, but because of his humbling, God highly exalted him. I want to take that on. The world is obsessed with placing value on the things that satisfy the lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh. But humility is the path of the upright. Those who humble themselves will be exalted by God. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have the approval of God. When we got married 18 years ago, I had no idea the lengths at which my petty behavior would go. Causing my husband grief seemed to be the one thing I was really good at. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about marriage. Brandon loves me and feels that he has tremendous wisdom to be able to lead me. He takes his stewardship seriously. He wants recognition by me, mainly that I can see the fruit of his efforts in my own life. I do. I tell him often how he has enriched my life, mainly by his desires for me, his leading of me. But sometimes I grieve him. One of the ways I've been known to grieve my husband is by not trusting in his words. Like when he's telling me something he read or heard, I would immediately begin to pick apart his words, telling him what I believed about the subject. I would dismiss statements he said if I heard someone else I actually respected disagree with it, standing on their side against my man. 
Boo, Jacqueline, you're such a beast. Uh, now, I automatically assume he is the smartest man on any subject because he actually does know a tremendous amount of stuff. I have been amazed over and over again at how wise and knowledgeable my husband is on a vast variety of subjects. He has such a practical yet unobvious way of seeing situations. It's really incredible. I cringe to think at how long I wasted not trusting his words. Not respecting his wishes grieves my husband. My guy is a simple yet complex man. And I, by my actions, refuse to respect his wishes. Like when he told me not to buy him more shirts. Guess what I did? Oh, you already know this story? <laughs> yep. I did what I wanted, and I actually expected him to be happy with it. What about when I tried to get him to take a greater interest in improving a relationship with a certain family member, when I already knew how he felt about that person? There were literally a thousand instances like this when I was so disrespectful of his wishes. That was early in our marriage, definitely not now. I try to learn as much about him as I can now so that I can be the most respectful wife possible. He feels heard. He feels understood. And most importantly, he feels respected by me. I am thankful for that. Another way I used to grieve my husband was I would manipulate him with my emotions by acting. And that made him sad. Pretending to be more offended, upset, or hurt than I actually am truly grieves my man. He used to worry that I was playing him. His heart couldn't trust me. He was suspicious of my motives. I did. I would over-exaggerate my hysteria, flinging accusations that were designed to defame his name. I would cry the biggest tears possible, refusing to let him go to bed until I felt better. Oh, and when he would accuse me of only wanting what I want, I'd tell him that, oh, of course you would say that. You just want to be difficult. Lord forbid he'd actually try to accommodate me. I would immediately overanalyze his movements and his words, drawing ridiculous conclusions designed to stamp out any intimacy gained. Then the argument would shift from the original problem to the new problem of how he just spoke to me. Are you done listening to this garbage? Because I'm sick of talking about it. Now, I question myself to see if I'm being an actor. I get up in my own face and I yell, stop the lies, lady. <laughs> it usually works. Then I become the most transparent, open honest version of myself this helps me consider him as greater than myself and not insult his kindness was i the only bad wife i'm asking for a friend <laughs> but that is not me anymore that troll doesn't exist i killed her i told my husband i am no longer okay with my terrible treatment of him and i pray that he'd forgive me the marriage that I have now has been hard won, and he has been very patient, very accommodating, very forgiving of my antics. I'm ashamed of myself as a woman, as a believer, but I am reformed, and I refuse to let random strangers and people of the world tell me that he's wrong about this tell me that i am right in behaving the way that i behave we don't get a free pass because we're women that is shameful behavior that is the way of the feral woman that's not me what ways have you recovered from your marriage wrecking behaviors i'd love to have more to look forward to in my own journey let me know down below in the comment section as a believer, I am not concerned with putting yet another teacher, nurse, or executive in the world. I am concerned with making a disciple and training a homemaker. Since she professes to be a believer, 
She has to be taught to pursue the things the Lord has set up in His Word. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unimportant Homemaker, and today let's talk about motherhood. When it comes to our children, how come we as believers never say things like, I want to raise a submissive child, one who will follow the Lord's commands without reservation? Must our goals for our children always be the same as the world? I personally want to see in my daughter obedience to scripture, holy fear of the Lord, shame-faced modesty in this shameless society we live in, holding fast to the word. I want to hear of her walking in truth. So before I elevate academics, I elevate the word of God. Before I teach her how to be fashionable, I model modesty. We don't discuss entertainers, but we talk about Dorcas and her important work and why the Apostle Paul was always rejoicing even while imprisoned. She sees how God led his people, stressing his sovereignty to command them, and then we look at our own lives at the order set up before us in the roles of marriage and motherhood. Our conversations revolve around the Lord and His goodness towards us who believe. We set goals of increasing our devotions, our prayers to, and our worship of the Father. This is the base of our homeschool. We start here because we want to be fruitful handmaidens of the Father. So why do you homeschool or why do you want to homeschool? Are you concerned about the increasing evil in the public school system? Are you interested in having high achieving children? Is your child an artist or other creative and you want to give them plenty of time to pursue their passions? Maybe your child is a hands-on learner who loves tinkering with tools and would benefit from a trade style education. Truth is you can homeschool for any reason or no reason at all. The beauty of it is that homeschool is just one of several choices you are allowed to make as a parent. Public school is a choice. Private school is a choice. Homeschool is a choice. I've homeschooled for 10 years. I think that this is the best type of lifestyle for children. My husband had family members who are homeschooled and I found those kids to be the most mature and diverse individuals I had ever met. This intrigued me, so we decided to try it for kindergarten before our daughter became of compulsory age in our state. She attended a four-year-old pre-K class in the public school system and has never returned. We call ourselves unschoolers, meaning Kaylee's education is tailor-made for her interest. Biblical literacy and understanding the unsearchable riches in Christ as she lives a life of obedience, submission, and thankfulness is foremost. But we also have other things that are important too. So for example, this year for her ninth grade, she asked if we can do a home economy program so she can become a better cook. So that's what we're doing now. The care and keeping of the home has many facets, and I want to be sure we hit most areas. Some of the things that we're learning are, I'm teaching her to mince garlic, how to sharpen knives, how to fix our vacuum cleaner. I'm encouraging her as she spends time with her four-year-old cousin in a way that encourages him. We identify different cuts of meat at the grocery store, we grind our own spices. We air out the home on breezy days. She's learning to use the ATM to deposit cash. She fixes special desserts for her father. And we talk a lot about why it's important to set our hearts and our intentions before we serve the family. She taught herself how to crochet and paint with watercolors. When we are all sitting in the living room talking, she just breaks out her crochet like a sweet old lady. It's so adorable. 
We will never go back to the traditional homeschool plan. My daughter is a creative. She has to be free to flow and learn her own way. I am no longer terrified that she won't match other children her age since conformity to the world's standards is not something I desire for her anyway. This lifestyle is not for everyone. In a world where conformity is most valued, it can be challenging to go against the grain. The lack of an accrediting body may lead some to question the effectiveness of this lifestyle. Social media platforms may not provide the validation and recognition you seek for your child's achievements. Facebook friends won't understand, and they certainly won't clap for your child's successes. You might even be confronted by well-meaning family members who love your child. They can't understand that you do too, and that's the reason why you chose to homeschool. However, as a united family, we have chosen to embrace our freedom and prioritize our own values over society's expectations. We have decided that we are not interested in being approved by any of the world's systems. It is a decision that allows us to live the life we truly desire. So, what type of homeschool are you doing and why? I'd love to hear all about it in the comments section below. That's it for today, guys. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you next time here at the Homestead. Bye. I have to confess that I assumed I was a modest woman, but since I've been making YouTube videos, I have been called out on my shirts. I didn't realize that I had grown casual about my clothes. My first reaction was not to get upset, though. Why? Because I have a submissive heart, and so I've been addressing this issue. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jacqueline, the Unborn No Maker, and today let's talk about womanhood. Holy women understand the command to dress in modest attire, proving how sexy and attractive and youthful we are is no longer our goal in life. Just as being dowdy and frumpy in appearance won't make us more pious either, a tasteful and classic clothing can be suitable for the holy woman. I want to preface that in order to understand anything, the holy woman must first be a true born-again believer in Jesus Christ. This believer is empowered and indwelt by the Holy Spirit to be able to do anything that pleases the Lord. The work and power of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life is not a trivial thing. It is absolutely mandatory and necessary. Without his work in her life, she will become a practitioner of works righteousness. This type of works is fleshly, carnal, and full of bad fruit or no fruit at all. That being said, the holy woman making a claim to godliness has new desires and motives given to her by the Lord. She desires to please him in all respects. She desires to do all that he has instructed in his word for his glory and not her own. This woman understands that God has set in his word detailed instructions for the submissive heart to follow. So when modesty is presented, her heart says, I will obey, as the Holy Spirit changes her into Christ's likeness. Every day of her life is moving toward more Christ-likeness. One way the Holy Spirit does that is in the area of modesty. Clothing and manner of dress is so important to women. We spend a great deal of our time and mental energy thinking about and shopping for clothes. We all have a special style we have been cultivating according to our lifestyle, behavior, and desires. Well, the Lord has a few things to say about this area as well. 
Before we begin, I want to make sure you have a submissive heart. The fact is, is that if God's own word, written by men, empowered by the Spirit, reveals rebellion and stubbornness in you instead of humble submission, you have a bigger problem than clothing. The word of God, the God you claim to serve, doesn't get to tell you what to do. So what will one single YouTube video tell you? Examine your heart and see if you are of the faith, because those who love me keep my commandments, said the Lord. Let's explore what the Bible says about it. In 1 Timothy 2.9, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Obviously, we must never take scripture out of context, but examine what this word meant to those to whom it was written. The church where Timothy was stationed must have had a big problem with modesty. The wearing of clothing needed to be addressed in a major way. In our modern times, I find this information highly needed as well. We live in a very lavish society, one that applauds excess and luxury and boastfulness. It will do the holy woman well to reject taking her advice on dress from the sin-soaked world around her, but instead look to scripture to guide her. We see the instruction of modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. When we look into those words, we find the definitions don't really convey the weightiness of the word. Shamefacedness means self-control and discretion, but in reality, this word has more of the meaning of being restrained by shame and bashful. So, Maybe the thought of being ashamed makes you refrain from wearing something unbecoming. When you consider this contrasted with the world's desires for women, words like empowered, siren, assertive, fierce, and the like, the meaning becomes even more clear. The things the world flaunts, such as the sexualization of our bodies, are not fitting for holy women. We ought to have a simple, shame-faced attitude towards flaunting our bodies. It stands in stark contrast to the world. We hide the private areas of our bodies to preserve the integrity of our own hearts as well as to refuse to be a stumbling block to men. We protect and hide our nakedness, being unwilling to put it on display in order to receive some distorted version of attention. We ought not be known for our unrestraint. This is the way of the worldly woman. She refuses to be restrained. It offends her. She feels that no one should tell her what to do with her body, especially not God, who wants to hide her opportunity to get glory and adoration. Like I said, if the word of God can't tell you what to do, you have a bigger problem than wanting to show your body to receive attention. I'll leave you with this final scripture. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I've had to revisit the scriptures over the last few weeks. If you go back and look at my earlier videos, you will see me dressed and modestly in my shirts. I had no idea that I had become complacent. Guys, I really do spend the majority of my time at home <laughs> and no one comes here. We hardly ever have visitors. But I've gotten lax in that. My own daughter is more modest than I am. So once I got the criticisms from people, I'm sorry, not criticisms, correction, because that's what it is. When I got those corrections, I immediately sought out the shirts she was mentioning and I threw them away. Well, I asked my daughter if she wanted any because she wears them. She wears them under her 
dresses for modesty's sake. And I wore them as shirts. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how far I had gone. And so I, I talked with my daughter. I talked with my husband and I corrected myself because that is what the word of God teaches us. The word of God is instructive. It is supposed to teach and admonish us. So I myself have had to revisit this. And so I just want to encourage you to revisit it. My last thought. <laughs> Sin sick women purchased by God and filled with the Holy Spirit are now to pursue holiness. You are not your own to dictate and demand rights. You are the Lord's. Glorifying God and not exalting self to receive glory is now the mandate of your life. Glorify God with your dressing. 